Perfect. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. We've still got a couple of people joining in, but um, we're going to just do a quick presentation before we jump into the demo with Ken in a moment's time. So I don't know if you want to say hello, Ken, as well. Hi, everybody. Perfect. Oh. That's Ken going with, um, as we'll show you his face. So this is us. I'm Isaac. And um, this is part two, this session today. So um, we've already done a session on model checking, and today is really just to follow up on that. And uh, we'll get into a little bit about what's left in the series, what we're planning on doing through the summer, and then what we're going to do as we head back into September, October time for the for this series as well. So, um, yeah, thanks for all those for joining us again. It's nice to see your, your commitment to the cause. So today we're just going to talk about what the first session was um, for model checking. Uh, we're going to take another look at the feedback survey uh, forms just to see what's changed and uh, what everybody is still keen to see. And um, then we'll go into the demonstration, really, talking about what are the next steps when it comes to model checking, uh, what our future sessions are going to look like, and then we'll have a little Q&A as we work our way through. So the first thing, just to quickly mention to everybody, is that throughout this sort of break, so we've got this session now, and then they've been running fortnightly. So we've got another session on, I think, what would be the 1st of July, um, which the details to be confirmed in this presentation, so don't worry. Um, but that's with that's on another subject I'll get into. After that, we have got a bit of a pause uh, from sort of the 1st of July through to the, the 1st or, you know, whenever it is in September, early September. So what we're going to do is we're going to run a series of webinars through that period, and they are going to be repetitive. So um, they're introductory workflow sessions, like the first one that we did at the very, very start of this uh, workshop series but in case you've got new people that want to just you know look at what Salibri is all about if you want to have a look at the kind of bigger picture with us again um, and just sort of restart that process or, or get other people on board uh, on the journey so they are going to be repetitive so you would only really in effect need to join one um, unless you wanted to <laughs> Do, you're welcome to um, but all of those that have registered for this series then a quick question for you is just to say would you like to be automatically enrolled into the next uh, sort of uh, series that are going through uh, it would just be one of those sessions um, so the first one in effect towards the end of July so um, if you'd like to be automatically enrolled so you don't save yourself so the hassle of having to re-register then just let me know and uh, I can get you registered on for that You'll also then receive a copy of the recording that you can share with people, but I didn't want to automatically enroll anybody if it wasn't something of interest to you. So I um, thought I'd put this poll out there. We'll just wait another 30 seconds so that we can get all those answers. So the, the last session, which I'm getting into a little bit more detail on in a little while is on the subject of Kobe, just for reference. Um, and then the series, the, this sort of introduction an introductory webinar that's probably going to run every two weeks if not every month um, through July and then August so there's not going to be many of them but uh, possibly somewhere between two and four before we get back into September so thanks for answering all of that and I'm just going to close this poll down so the general sort of gist as, as far as I can see is that uh, the majority of you would like to be there so thanks for that I will um, consider those that have said no and make sure that you're not on that automatic enrolling list but you're also welcome to join if you change your mind so running into it, so part two of model checking. So just to revamp on what we did before, just in case those uh, that are with us today weren't on that previous session. So we spoke about the variety of ways in which you can check for, uh, you know, for issues and then just check models in general, whether it's visual, whether you're searching for things, whether you're utilizing Celebrity's rule sets, which we went into detail on. Um, the main focus in part one was in and around the rule sets, which was uh, Ken's sort of demonstration really broke into a lot of that. So we also then spoke about how beneficial they are, you know, whether it's checking for your building standards, following company practices, uh, you know, internal costs, the mitigating sort of laborious tasks, risk, you know, lot, lots of different benefits for, for being able to optimize and automatically sort of generate this workflow of, uh, of rules uh, for your company. So um, naturally, there's a sort of combination between both geometry and data. And we've looked at a little bit on what that sort of comprehensive library is of the rule sets. I mean, you can see on the right hand side, a good summary of just a lot of the common rules that you can use. Um, in addition, you know, we've, we've also spoken about the, the value of finding them as early as possible. And, and naturally cost is the huge saver there uh, when you find issues before they get to, to site level. So the previous video, if you are interested, just to go back and view that one again, um, can be viewed on our YouTube playlist. And everybody that has registered for these webinars will have a copy of that. 
So feel free to jump back onto YouTube and watch that and then watch this one once you're done. Um, and as I said a minute ago, we did receive a lot of queries about uh, Kobe and wanting to get into a bit more detail on how the extension works with Celebri. So we've heard you and that's going to be our next session. So um, it's going to be with another chap called Simon Gilbert, who's our technical services manager, and he's going to uh, hosting, be hosting a demonstration of, of just how that works. And we will do our best to squeeze that into a 45 minute window for you. So uh, just very quickly recapping on the, the recent survey sort of feedback here. So uh, we've done information takeoffs, we've done classifications, we've done sort of the first part of model checking. We have touched on a lot of these other subjects, whether it's looking at the rule requirements in terms of the parameters of those rules. Um, we haven't spoken about model comparisons and revisions yet, but that one might well be our first session when we come back in September and our Ken will explain a little bit why based on what he's going to showcase today. Um, Today is really going to be in and around the communication element of what you're finding in those rules. So what are we doing with the information that we've uh, we've got? What are we doing with the problems that we found? How can we communicate and collaborate with other people on a project? Um, but when it comes to the ability to federate models, again, this is the sort of stuff we've touched on. So um, exporting to IFC will be in maybe another subject that we come back to in September, hopefully in early September with you guys as well. So um, this is today and we're not forgetting about the rest. Um, but there was also a curiosity, there's always a curiosity about, you know, in-depth sort of training as well. It just goes into detail on all of this more. So I won't read all of this because we show this every week, but there still are those courses available in July and then in August. What you uh, get as a part of those courses is seen on the right hand side of the screen and there are still a few spaces remaining. So if you are keen to join these, do let me know and get you booked on and it'll be great to see you there. And you'll have a familiar face, hopefully with that training. Um, with, with Ken, I think Ken's going to be there as well, um, just as one of the facilitators on the training course. But uh, nonetheless, you'll go through this full certification process too. So part two of model checking. Now we've shown this workflow every time because this is a sort of big picture when it comes to Celebri. And I'm not going to read through it every week, but uh, this is the sort of gist of, of what we've done and, and what the whole picture is within Celebri Office. And today we are honing in on communications. So uh, how do we share reports? How do we communicate our results? Uh, what is BCF Live Connector? What is the new communication uh, for the way in which we, we want information to come back to us when it's been uh, you know, fixed and those issues are no longer existent? And then to repeat that sort of big bubble picture of uh, you know importing and federating our IFCs, updating them, uh, working our way through you know the classifications to recheck if the components need to be re-identified if there's problems there, and then the full on you know rules to check for issues as well, uh, right through to information takeoff at the end when everything is okay and everything is fit for purpose and we can start to use the information and the models that we've got and, and be confident in what we're what we're dealing with. So. Um, this is where we're at today. So that's everything from me for the time being. I will come back to me a little bit later, but it's over to you, Ken, really. Okay, cool. <clears throat> Let me grab the screen. Ah, good point. Um, Let me just share with you. Yeah, go on because this has done something strange. No worries, I'm just sharing it with you now. That's it, perfect, thanks. No problem. Yeah, we've used this every week for, what, four or five weeks now, and for some reason today, got to webinars, signed in as a different email address, and isn't given the same sharing controls that it normally has, so apologies. But uh, just tell you about housekeeping, if you've got any questions, um, I just go keep an eye on them now because I'm going to be busy. But there is a, a questions or a, is it questions or chat? Questions. There's a panel on the go to webinar panel. If you've got anything, you can fire in there. And towards the end of the session, we'll take a look at that. So, really quick recap. This is the model that I left two weeks ago, and in that model, I went through the process of bringing the whole thing together, doing a bunch of checks, and then. I went through the process of recording a couple of issues, which is where these grey triangles are. So ideally, before we go to the next stage, we need to complete all of these because otherwise there's outstanding issues. And if we get through a, a new iteration where we have a new revision that we bring in, we may potentially miss issues or lose issues and, and not get the full picture of what's going on. So I'm going to close that down. And what I'm going to open up, I've got two separate versions here, so I can show you the, the two different workflows we have. So we have 
the traditional offline format of reporting and that involves using this area called communication where we build presentations and then those presentations are pushed out to reports whether that's paper electronic or physical or it goes out to bcf but a manually created bcf file that then can be transferred by email dropbox onedrive sharepoint whatever system you choose so in here i had already created a single uh, presentation work in progress with just this one single issue and I need to bring in the stuff that I've already gone through here so in the intervening period between last week or two weeks ago and now uh, went through and I pretty much reported all of these off so I've gone through every single one of them <clears throat> come down to the warning triangle gone here drilled down to the actual issue itself and then I've created a slide so these slides are still all here, but right now they only exist in here. So in the next stage, which is what we're here to look at, is communication. We're going to build a new presentation. Now we can build presentations from scratch that will just record what's on the screen, which is not very exciting right now, let's be honest. But what I want to do is record not from the information takeoffs, not from any Excel or BCF. I want to bring in my checking results. Now in a real project that has 200 issues where there's 75 here, 75 here, and 50 here, and hopefully that adds up to 200. In that case, we'd probably do this a couple of times. Once to bring in invalidation, repeat that again, bring in the space checks, and then repeat that again to bring in the intersections. Here, I've only got, uh, I can't count, 20, 31 issues. So I'm just going to bring these all in generically as um bim validation and i'll just give that a prefix bv prefix you'll see why in a second i'll click ok and off it goes and does its little thing so when it's finished i end up with a presentation so you can think of this as a, a folder or um some people have heard compare it to powerpoint and then these are the slides on the powerpoint but it's it's just a grouping of all the things I want to report from this BIM validation view. I've previously reconfigured the screen so that the issue sorters across the side here. When I'm running at the, the usual 4K resolution it would run at when I'm not doing this stuff, then that can be undocked and that can be made much, much bigger. And once you've done that, you can then defeat the purpose of doing that by making this like an extra large image, which takes up half the screen. But let's let's not do that. But you've got control over the size there. So I'll put that back to small and I'm going to put it back docked to where it was previously. A little bit of space would be nice. <clears throat> In terms of processing it next, there's different things we could do. We could take this file exactly as it stands and push it into Celebrity anywhere. And anybody then within your organization that has access to the file and permission to edit it, they can pick up the file exactly as we're looking at now. And they can start to go around and add comments and tweak things. And so, for example, here I've got red wall. My description shows red wall, but actually the red, there's lots of red stuff up here. So what are we talking about? So a little cheat thing that I could do there is click in here, select the wall with the info tool, which paints it green. And then what I could do is just refresh that view. Or if I'm not quite close enough, go a little bit closer, then refresh it. And then up here, obviously, I need to change the description and just say that's green. And hopefully, the person picking up the report is not red, green, colorblind. But you can see we've got a couple of different images. So this is just reporting us from different angles. Maybe if I want to see it from over here somewhere, we can come in a lot closer. We can go right inside if we want to do something like that. Um, and then we could grab another image. So all I'm doing here is just preparing, presenting, polishing really what's already here. Reorder it, maybe um, if I look down the list here, I know, for example, that this set of columns, we're not going to have time to look at it today, but I know that this is fixed when we do a model revision. So when we go to the next revision of the architectural building, these columns miraculously start to hold up the roof. So I could start to order it, do what I like. I'm using the issue sorter. We can be using the issues. So across here, we have all these columns. And actually, the most important button that I need to show you, and let me just try and remember how to do this. There we go. Across here, if I 
draw a little rectangle around there. That little thing in there is actually the most important button on this dialog because what it allows you to do is go and turn on and off the columns in the table. Because once the columns are in the table, you can then start to sort them. So I could say, right, there's a bunch of these that I can see my name on. So what I'm going to do is select everything that says Ken, and I'm going to right click, and I'm going to flag it or mark it as selected. Once it's flagged, if I come back across here, and this time use a different button, this little flag button here, then what I can actually do with that is just click. And that will isolate, so I'm now only looking at the four items that are relevant to me. So rather than spend time wading through 200 issues, I can focus on the, the 20 or the 50 or whatever number it is that's important. If I want to further organise this, we can move things like there's a modification date. <clears throat> so that's listed right now from oldest to newest. If I right click, we can change that order so it's the newest stuff on top. Um, any one of these columns can be used, but I actually need to turn the flag off to get something more useful. So responsibility already used, presentations already selected, status or checking decisions, probably a good one because <clears throat> there are a bunch in here are rejected and then there's another bunch that are accepted. So the important thing in here then is the ones that are accepted, we're not worried about so much because they've been accepted. So what I really want to worry about are the ones that are rejected because these are the ones that are of importance and need to be processed and pushed out to be sent to the authoring tool to be fixed. So again, if I flag those ones, we can then start to focus on just exactly what's what here. In terms of editing and adding comments and things, you might have noticed if I select more than one thing, big bits of this dialogue disappear and is like, whoa, what happened? But actually the reality is if you think about it, this is one unique item, so I can do whatever I like to it. Whereas if I select a whole bunch of things, it's no longer unique. So I can't change an image because it's going to change on all of them. But what I can do is say, well, let's actually, these issues I've selected, let's give them a, a priority and say these are, oh, so I'll add that onto there. That adds it to the priority field across to the side. So I can then use that as well. I can bring that across, sort it by priority. The issue type is error for all of them. Maybe it's just for info. And maybe the tags that are on there, I want to add an extra one. And just put that on in addition to that. So we've got controls that we can modify multiple things at once. Or I could just add a comment to lots of issues at the same time. Preferably without the spelling mistakes. There we go. So we can do all that sort of stuff. But that's all just about organizing, polishing, preparing, and getting it read to the report. The report bit is a critical part because that's what then pushes this whole thing out. So irrespective of what's selected, what's flagged, what's not flagged, I hopefully have some stuff that isn't flagged. Yes, I do. What I'm going to do is go and click this little report button up here because that's what pushes the whole thing out to the outside world. <clears throat> so if I click report, it gives me a big old dialog here. I can choose to report only everything or not only, but everything. Um, or I can choose to report only these ones that are flagged. So that's the ones with the little flag symbol down here. Um, and you'll see likewise on all of them whatever they happen to be elsewhere on the screen. So I've got that choice. I'm going to report everything. There's only uh, 31 items. We can then choose, are we going to report it to any of these three formats here? Well, I can't freehand draw. Um, this is supposed to be a little highlighter tool and it's going very badly wrong. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll come back to BCF in a second. But um, we can output to this um, general report as a BCF or an RTF. To be honest, they generate a lot of paper. You have extensive controls to set portrait landscape, A4, A3, A2, whatever size, whatever margin. But beyond that, realistically, this is just generating a big pile of paper. Um, let me just make a new folder.
So if I save that, that's going to open up sometime today. There you go. Our BIM validation report. So I can see who did what, when they did it. The downside of this is, I mean, it, it does exactly what it says on the tin. It produces a PDF and it lists all of the report and everything else. But as a PDF, it doesn't give you the control to give it branding and give it any sort of corporate identity. So it's useful to generate lots of paper quickly, um, but if you want to brand it, it's, it's not so good. So if I report again, I can do the same thing to RTF. We should put a poll up now and this will tell us everybody's age. Who knows what an RTF file is? Do you know what an RTF file is, Isaac? Oh, he's going all quiet word, on me. Text Word document. And it's rich text format is what it stands for. And it's, it's poor man's word from many, many, many years ago from Windows 3.1.1 days and, and all that sort of stuff. And just for you guys that are coming back in a couple of weeks' time, Simon told me about that because he's old enough to remember those things. I was, I was just a baby. At university. But anyway, uh, RTF is, is one step. It's a, a reduced version of a Word document. It opens in Word these days, uh, but it's a manual document. So if you wanted to use it, you would still have to go in and manually add your branding and colors and, and all that sort of stuff. So the best method we've got for actually outputting a report, if you want control over it, is the coordination report where we push it to Excel. You can see I've been here before. This one I created only this morning. I'm going to create another default. Normally, we would aim for the company to have this sort of thing all set up in advance um, so that you're literally just picking the template and pushing it out. But in here, you can see this is the default. I can go change the image. I'll leave it as Celebri. We have very strict corporate guidelines on what our corporate identity is. So it's, it's a particular blue and a particular yellow. And it's none of these, so let's hope nobody in, in HQ sees this thing. But you can see I can customize the content there. I can come down here. We can customize all of this to something else again. Uh, we could take certain things like you know, author, for example. Maybe we'll take that and we'll spin it so that it reads up and down. We'll take the slide picture. We'll make it a whole load wider. So we'll do something like that, and then we'll stretch it down. So this is... This is choosing the format and the size. Um, what else can we have? The description. We'll make sure wrap text is on. That's good. We'll stick it in the center. Uh, we'll have it left hand aligned. We'll make it bold because that's an important field. Title's also important. Uh, let's also rotate that upwards. We'll make that bold and we'll make that red. So I'm making a bunch of changes here. I could also decide there's certain fields that I haven't used. So due date. Um, stage, I did set priority in some of them. Labels, I can't remember if I used that or not. If I take those out completely, then I don't have to worry about them in a minute. So I'll take that, close that, save the changes. So that's now my template is defined. And all that the user has to do at this stage is come in here, report, Excel, that template, save the report. And what it'll do is push the data from the table here into those fields that I've left enabled inside the report. And it'll have that really subtle branding on the top of the, the header. And it'll put the title in there. So it's doing quite a bit of work because there's 31 issues, but there's also a whole bunch of separate slides. So you can see now it's done all of that and it's pushed everything through. I maybe should have taken that field there and put it into is it that or is it that one of them there we go and make sure wrap text is on so we can do that sort of stuff so it's just playing around with the formatting but it in effect produces a dirty big report of all of the content that we actually selected to output there and if we use this properly and you know Excel way better than I do, you can set your page breaks and your margins and all your other bits and pieces so that you get a proper formatted document out of this at the end of the process. So I'm going to close that down. That's, um, we'll save that. The hell. Uh, we'll save that. Uh, that's our paper. I tend to refer to them as dead end formats because we tend not to bring data back in from there. The preferred method is to go to something like this where we can output to BCF either here or live, which I'll show you in a minute. 
by using BCF, we can send the BCF file straight into the authoring tool. So the big advantage here is this that I'm about to create can be opened in Archicad in this case, because it's an Archicad model, but it goes to the authoring tool. So if that's Revit, if it's Vectorworks, if it's Tecla, whatever it is, that can be opened up. We do need to, if you're going to be using this and it's the first time you're using it, what you do need to do is have a conversation with whoever you're communicating with at the other end to work out what version of BCF their software supports. There are differences between them. So the file format for one and two is a BCF zip, 2.1 and three, whatever it becomes available is a BCF. Um, and the actual content slightly different. So version one only supports one image, for example. Version two supports multiple images. Version 2.1 also supports additional fields that uh, we've not actually used here, but can be used. So I'm going to go for version two purely because when I write this out, it's going to show me the file, but I've got a little free BCF or piece of software that allows me to actually open it and just show you what a BCF file is, because we talk about them and it's the backbone of what we do. It stands for BIM Collaboration Format, but what it means is it generates a report and for each issue that we find and report in Celebri, now let me find the one that's got loads of images, I suppose it was that one there, for this it gives us the title, in fact, it's now a green wall. I've got the description that gives me all the, the stuff generated from the rule. So that's a one click to produce that. And then it gives me the images. And these are just PNGs that I can open up and you can see them. So it's just a, a snapshot, literally, of what's in there. Any comments and everything else are included with that. If it's attached to the image, it goes with it. All of this sort of stuff. So you'll see that was added to that particular image. So there's a whole load of stuff in there, but that's very much the offline format of what we produce and what we output. Once we send it out, that's a different thing because we're sending it out to the authoring tool to go and have issues fixed. Ideally, at that point, what we then get is a little while later, a model where 100% of the issues are fixed and then we have to bring them back in and do what we do in Celebri. But we can probably do a separate session purely on model revision comparison and how we check differences between two versions of a model and then how we incorporate that into what we're looking at here. So that's something for another time. We don't have time to get into that just now. What I am going to do though is just save this as it stands so it remembers what I have done and then I am going to close this down and I'm going to open up this live version. It's just a different version of the file that I've not messed around with. This time what I'm going to do is I've got my checking results and I've actually already created a whole load of um, slides and things in here and I'm going to just very quickly create a new presentation from BIM Validation Architectural. In fact let's do a general space check. Just call it SP for spaces. Okay, that. So I'm going to come back to that in a second. I'm using a, a now a hybrid method. So with our new BCF Live Connector, you can completely bypass communication. Some people still like to use this because it gives you the ability to gather and um, process and tidy up, polish your reports or polish your presentations before you push them to the web. But it's, it's entirely up to you. You can go straight from checking you can go straight to Live Connector. But the first thing I need to do is actually make the connection. So we come into the BCF Live Connector and we switch it on. And once it's switched on, we then choose who we're gonna go with. So I have a test account on BIMTrack. So we click that and I use this Assist webinar. And you'll see that started already and it's importing 11 issues. Eh, 21, can't count, there's 11 that I'm about to import. So that connects and it just checks how many is there and then it starts to download them. It does them in batches of five, so there's never an absolutely massive 200 megabyte download. There'll still be the big download, but it does it in stages so that you're, you're not sitting there wondering what's going on with it. That then shows me what's on the server, shows me what's live on there. I can actually see it's as part of the Celebri Assist Hub and it's called the Assist Webinar Project. And I can see what's in here. So the content is, similar to what we have in issue details, 
but it's a different format because it's, it's BCF Live. So we can see here, we've got the title, we've got the, the description, we've got the other bits and pieces. Um, we can add new images, we can look at different snapshots, we can do the same sort of things we had previously. There are a few differences because this is connected through the cloud to the server and the server uses the BCF API standard. There are certain things um, they behave differently. So, for example, the uh, section planes are visible right now, and that's because BCF API doesn't know what a section plane is. It's not something that's supported by the standard. So, that automatically switches on. I know the developers are looking to address it in different ways and have controls so that we can control it, but right now, if we see that, we just have to press T to turn them back off again. Uh, similarly, if I was to add any markups and use nice, big, bright, bold, yellow lines or any colour at all, when the markup goes through the transition out to the cloud and back again, the BCF API doesn't store any data in relation to the, the line thicknesses of the colours, so everything comes back hairline and red. Um, so it might look different, it's not actually a fault, it's just a limitation of the standard. But without that standard, we couldn't use the system. So it's, it's catch-22. So with this stuff that I've pulled down from the cloud, I can go and start to tweak it. And I could change things like, let's make that in progress. And let's now make it an issue. It doesn't have a stage that would have to be added on the cloud. Uh, we'll say this is a high priority thing, which is due by the end of the month. It's currently assigned to me. I can only assign it to me or whoever else is on the project inside BIM track in this case. So it's myself, or it's, it's Lowry and HQ, and probably better not upset them by changing loads of these, because then you'll get loads of emails telling them about it. Um, but we have some controls. As a different environment, because as I say, you're using the cloud settings, so it's very much controlled and administered from the cloud. So if you want any paper reports, any PDFs, any other bits and pieces like that, that has to be generated from the web browser rather than Celebrity itself, because the cloud is then acting as the single source of the truth. Anybody can sign into the, the cloud, or anybody with access can sign into the cloud, and they can add and manage and, and do, what they, do what they do based on their user rights. So that's fine for all the stuff I've brought in. If I want to add an issue, I can just, actually, I don't want to do that. Hey, let's just remove that one again. I can remove it now because I haven't synchronized it. If it synchronizes, it's then on the cloud and it can only be removed from the cloud by the administrator or creator or whatever the status happens to be. So let's uh, tidy up, do that, do that. Let's go grab the model tree. And let's hide that from the selection. Much tidier. So we've got that and what I'll do now is just create a new issue. It has a red, not a red cross, a white cross, red mark, a warning, and it's there because I can't send something to the cloud that has no title. Um, so that was good. I don't know what I pressed there. Oh, too late. Sent it. <laughs> so this is organized by modification date. So I can change that. It's the top one. Oh, I managed to, what did I do? Default. Default view, that'll do me. Uh, we can see it's in progress, it's for comment or it's a request or whatever it happens to be, so I can tweak it. But you'll see it's now currently syncing. And if we give it like five seconds, click on something else, then it's actually gone and processed. So that's finished and that's sent to the cloud. The other thing I can do is actually import either from something that's selected inside the presentation, either selected issues or marked issues. I don't have any of those in here, but what I can do is from the checking results, go and grab, um, let's just take that one, the intersections between architectural components. So we grab that. Again, there's slight differences because we're now using an open standard and we're connected to the server, then the values here need to correspond to the values we have in Celebri. So an error, BIMTREC calls an issue. Uh, assign to, I can only assign it to named people on the project, so myself or Lowry. Uh, for something like this, it's just a generic thing, then we just leave it as undefined. 
we could put additional tags and comments on if we want to mark it for architectural. But I've gone and done that, and you'll see it's now got a little triangle in here. So it's currently sinking. It has sunk. Um, or synced. Uh, what I can do is actually double click there, and that'll take me back to the results and show me where they are. Because another way that we can add slides is in here, we then have this extra column up here because it's got a live link. So this shows me the BCF Live slide. Um, and what I can also do is add a slide at any other point. If we just do something like that, it's an issue. Thank you very much. And this is now capturing. It's the same one, so I won't bother going through the whole process, but um, we can do that sort of thing as well. So there is a different way, there's a different process and a different workflow of going about that. But in essence, that's how we can also communicate live with the cloud-based system. If I was to go to BIMTrack now, and it just so happens I was in here earlier today, if I look at issues, <clears throat> then this is probably the very latest one that I just sent up. Yeah, it was, uh, and I don't think, did I give it any details? Possibly not, but you'll see there's other bits here that we can go in, and if there's a particular group, like this is ARC, um, or Team Inove, whatever that is, Notify, I can put notifications on, I can do different tags. That, I'm not going to get into in great detail, because that will vary wildly from project to project, depending on how it's configured, from system to system, whether it's BIM Sync, BIM Track, BIM Collab, AconX, Stream BIM, and another one that I've forgotten right now, so terribly sorry, whoever it was, Trimble Connect, there we go. Um, it will vary from system to system because they've all got the different interface. It's, it's a bit like uh, Mac OS and Windows, it's, it's that sort of thing. So that uh, pretty much is a, a rapid run through the communication process and how we send things out. As I say, in the, the next session that we'll pick up after the summer, we'll be picking up from this point. So we'd be playing a little game of, let's pretend that we've sent this out to the various different teams for them to make their changes to the models. They'll then return the model. And what we'll pick up in the next session is once we've got that return model, what we actually do with it to process it and push it through. So uh, there we go. Um, I see there's a couple of questions. Yeah, Was there cool. anything else, Isaac? Did you pick anything else up? Um, no, but I thought it, we've got a, a couple of minutes actually left of the of the demonstration. So uh, one of the questions is sort of tailored to uh, model revision management. So I did reply to I it, but I yeah. might want to elaborate a little bit. So um, I'll read it to you. So um, are there any rules in Salibri that you can compare the attributes of two IFC models? If yes, could you please advise uh, which rule number uh, it can be referred to? So. Um, I thought the best one is 206, which is model comparison, right? Given that they are the same. I have no idea what the number is. <laughs> yes, yeah, certainly I, the model comparison rule. Uh, yeah. I'm the world's worst for remembering uh, combinations of names and numbers. So let me just save this and go back into the first one. I'll close that connection. Um, gonna, I did look at the library to find 206 as the number. <laughs> I have no idea what the numbers are. I, I know 222 is component distance. Rule number one is the general intersection rule, and now I've run out of numbers and names. But the reason I come back in here is this particular model, um, or, or this particular session, has the BIM validation architectural role set. So this is one of the uh, example roles that ships with Salibri. Uh, we've, I do can't remember, did we do that as a session, or was that a recording? There is a recording on YouTube which goes through the whole process and explains the setup of this sort of stuff. But one of the things that's part of that, if I look at the role, is an additional rule set called Model Revisions Comparison Architecture. And when you actually get into the rule sets folder within, see users, public, Salibri, Salibri, or wherever your local path is, in our example rules, we have flavored versions for architecture, for MEP, and for structure. And what that rule does, if I go to checking, and I'm going to destroy my model. I'm going to be upset. Let me just save this. That's saved. Checking. If I open, I can then bring in model revisions, comparison, architecture. Now, I need to prepare the models and everything else, but what that 
rule set does is compare the components, the spaces, and the building. So the building is the structure of the IFC, so the file name's the same, or the dates and the timestamps the same. The components looks at the geometry of the components, what's new, what's removed, what's changed, all that sort of stuff. And then the spaces, likewise, if there's geometry changes or there's changes to the names of the rooms, the names of the, or the numbers, or anything, then it picks all that sort of stuff up. So that is your go-to rule for model revision comparison, funnily enough called model revision comparison. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Perfect, thank you. Um, another question for you. So um, is the BCF file something similar to the Navis Clash detection report where you click images and JPEGs open up? Um, do you need to produce a zip folder with the JPEGs or is this done automatically? Okay, I, I can't compare directly with Navis because I don't know it well enough. Uh, but you know, BCF is just a completely self-contained, it's, it's a container file. So the one that I created is in here and that's it. It's just a dot, because it's a BCF2, it's a dot BCF zip file, but everything it needs is included in there. So you will see that this is, it's not gonna be that small. It's uh, six meg, so it's not not terrible. Um, but everything it needs, all the notes, all the images, all the bits and pieces, you just literally send that backwards and forwards and transfer that. You don't need anything else. You just need something to read it at the other end. And hopefully that answers that. Cool. Okay, great. Um, other question for you. So um, let me just read this through properly. Okay, so yeah, the gist of it. So when you created the um, the presentation from the communication tab and from your checking results, can you bring in third party BCF results into the communication window? Yeah, so in communication, when you add a new presentation, you have the option to bring in from a BCF file. Um, ideally, I mean, just, it's getting incredibly complicated. I'm trying not to tie everybody in knots, but if we were to send a BCF file out to some other party for them to um, add their own comments and add their own images and do their own updates and things like that, when they return it, part of the part of the system when you create an issue is we have something called topic ID. So mine is turned off by default because I don't really care what it is. It's, it's just it's a string of of characters, but it's a unique string of characters that means. Celebrity always knows that this string relates to these items in this issue at any point in time. So if we send a BCF out and we get a BCF back, as long as that topic ID is unchanged, which it shouldn't change, if it's the same BCF file and it's from our original BCF, then we can bring it straight back in and we can update it and show the changes. If it's a new BCF that's come from a different model from some other third party, then we would just bring that in as its own standalone BCF file and it would come in, but it wouldn't have any links to the components. It wouldn't necessarily have any links to the model because it might even be nothing to do with this model, but we do have the ability to bring it in either here or in um, anywhere. So not everywhere, Perfect. but pretty much anywhere. Okay, great. Um that's sort of it on the questions side for now, but I have just got a quick recap on what the next session is going to be. So uh, let me just change the screen back to myself, if you don't mind. Hopefully everybody can see this. So thanks for that, Ken. Um, so as mentioned, the next session is gonna be about the Kobe extension. So uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll, we'll introduce you to it. We will uh, basically run you through what the uh, requirements are to deliver effective reports and uh, the Kobe deliverable. Um, we'll showcase just how that workflow looks within Celebri, um, what happens when you have identified issues and what needs to be uh, done with those before you can actually complete the, the Kobe side. Um, and then obviously all of these sessions are recorded and we'll do a follow-up survey just to re-engage. And I have a feeling in 45 minutes it, we, we're going to really fly through things. So if people want to get a little bit more of an extensive overview of what Kobe is and, and that sort of um, break down from us then just get in touch we're always happy to have those discussions with you directly as well um 
and I mentioned this right at the very beginning, but the workshop series that we're sort of doing through summer is these, and just to recap on this, uh, regular sort of introductory webinars until September. I'll host those. Uh, they will be repetitive and repeated, so uh, you won't need to join all of them, just hopefully one if you want to see those. And then in September, Ken and I will be back on it again on tour, uh, doing the workshop series on, on new topics, factoring in things like exporting to IFC, federating models, um, might be something along the lines of the solution center, basically all the things you see on the screen. Um, so the first, the, the next session is on the, the 1st of July at two o'clock, same time. You've all been registered for that. So you should see some reminder emails popping through your inbox for that. Uh, and just another quick reminder that our Classroom courses are still running through July and August. We'll do more in Q4. Um, but thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, if anybody has any, got any other questions, I will stay on the line just for another minute or so and um, happily answer those. And if you want to get in touch with us directly, just drop us an email, get in touch, and we'll do what we can to help.